Hi, everyone. This is Sam Silverman, Managing Partner of EV5AN. Thank you for taking time uh, to join us on today's webinar. Today, we're going to be talking about how to avoid losing money in an EV5 project. Uh, sounds simple, but there's a lot of things to, to consider. And we're going to try and isolate those into four major, four major items and kind of focus the conversation around these, these four items. During the webinar today, if you have questions, please use the chat box and we'll try and cover as many questions as we can uh, at the end of the webinar. Also, if you're interested in getting a copy of the slides, um, please reach out to us. You can schedule a call. I've shared the link in the chat box. Uh, schedule a call and then chat with us and we can get you a copy of, of the slide deck as well. And this video will be on our YouTube channel uh, in, the next, in the next few days. Okay. Uh, we'll skip through that. Uh, so quick quick overview about EV5AN. We're a leading EV5 investment fund manager. We've worked with thousands of investors from around the world. Uh, we operate more than 10 regional centers that cover the entire uh, continental United States. One of the things that uh, sets EV5AN apart from many of the other EV5 regional centers is a kind of obsessive focus on investment transparency. And we'll get into some more details about how um, this can be kind of reviewed and, and understood uh, in different contexts for investors. Um, but the main, the main point here is that we're fully transparent and we try to provide as much detailed information as we possibly can about the project, the investment, the risks, financial information. Um, that way our investors have a full picture of exactly what's happening. There's no way to reduce risk down to zero. EV5 investments must be at risk uh, to qualify for the green card. Um, but what we can do is make all relevant information available uh, so that investors can make a fully, a fully informed decision. Uh, we'll spend a few minutes today talking about how to identify red flags as well, and we've published a number of articles uh, that you can find on our website about um, how to identify you know, some of these red flags and, and what to look for. As I mentioned earlier, I'm Sam Silverman, one of the two managing partners of EB5AN. A little bit about my background and bio is there on, on the left side. Um, most importantly, worked previously at the Boston Consulting Group and also in, in various real estate investment and diligence roles. Uh, and my partner, Mike Schoenfeld, I'll let him jump in and, and introduce himself. And, and most importantly, um, both of us have you know, significant investment experience, which is, which is what we're really gonna be focusing today's conversation around. Perfect, thanks, thanks Sam. And as, as you mentioned earlier, with a focus of transparency, that's what brought us into the EB-5 industry uh, originally. We had both worked at the Boston Consulting Group and I was in uh, a large leverage buyout firm after that. And we realized that the EB-5 space was lacking in transparency back in 2011, 2012. And we thought that it made a lot of sense to try and bring that institutional knowledge to EB-5 and create uh, projects that uh, we're independent from the developer, completely transparent, and fit the needs of investors. And we're going to go through what those investor priorities uh, likely are later. Um, and yeah, we, we're just happy that uh, our, our backgrounds and our company has brought many high-quality deals to the market with a very high success rate. Great. And also, also with us today is Ahmed Khan, uh, an experienced EV-5 immigration lawyer who's been in the EV-5 space for for many years at this point, and I'll let Ahmed jump in and introduce himself and share a little bit about his experience in, in the EV-5 space. Yeah, thanks, Mike, or sorry, thanks, Sam. <laughs> I'm glad to be here today. Um, yeah, like Sam mentioned, I've been in this industry for over 10 years. I originally started with filing several hundred um, EB-5 immigrant investor applications, doing source of funds work, but over the years, I've actually worked also on the regional center side, representing one of the top regional centers in the space before ultimately joining um, EB-5AN with Mike and Sam, who I've known for over a decade as well and have placed definitely a lot of investors in, in the past. So we've had a great working relationship over the years and I've seen the different projects 
that you know eb 5 an has put together and yeah ultimately joined the company and um yeah happy to share my experiences today great all right so so continuing on as i mentioned earlier we're one of the only if not the only regional center that covers the entire country in terms of our regional center coverage which allows us to pick the best EV5 projects all around the country without any restrictions. Our investors are truly global. We have investors from more than 60 and we've been recognized by many of the leading uh, publications over the over the last 10 years for transparency, for projects, for helpful educational information for investors. There's lots of articles that you can that you can look at. All right, so now we'll get to we'll get to the highlights of of today's presentation, and we'll let Mike jump in first and kind of paint the overall picture for us in terms of how EB5 investors should be looking at making an EB5 investment into into a project today. Uh, uh, absolutely, thanks. And so, whenever I'm I'm talking to an investor, and really when we're thinking about structuring EB-5 projects from the start, the, the two key criteria, number one, immigration safety, get the green card. And how do you do that? By having an approvable project and knowing the jobs will be created or have already been created, which is even better. Second is make sure we get our investors their $800,000 back. Um, it's a very large investment. Most investors are not doing this for big financial gains. The green card is top priority. So the financial safety is number two. Numbers three and four kind of go in with, with those other factors of if you can be highly confident in getting the green card and the return of capital, then there's other factors such as investment duration, ROI, how those are important to you. And now with the passage of the RIA, you can layer in the other points of rural versus urban um, and things like that. But it always comes back down to our focus when diligencing well over 100 deals a year to choose the ones that we want to work on. It comes to that green card and the financial safety and finding deals where we can minimize risk on both of those key aspects. Yep, exactly. And so, you know, there there is no, you know, exact correct order here, right? As an investor, you've got to kind of identify what are the most important aspects for you and your personal family situation, you know, kids going to college, how quickly do you want the green card? You know, how how does the EV5 investment fit into your overall financial picture? You know, are you worth $10 million and you could lose the 800? You know, it wouldn't be a problem. Or, you know, are you only worth, you know, a million and $100,000 and this is the majority of your net worth. And so you really want to focus on principal, you know, protection. Everyone's situation is going to be different. And so, you know, these are kind of the four major buckets um, that you could, you know, really focus on in terms of, you know, selecting an investment that you want to consider. And just as a company, you know, EB5AN, our, our approach is, is this order, right? The purpose of an EB5 investment generally is you want to get the green card. No one's doing EB5. No one's doing an EB5 investment for fun or for just for a financial return. They want the green card and they don't want any problems. Right, that's typically number one, and so that's what we're optimizing for is number one. And then second, you know, most people they really want to protect the investment, and then you know goes goes down from there. Um, so that's kind of how how we would would break down the preferences. All right, so moving on. So what are what are these four items that EV5 investors should consider? So these are the four main items that we look at in terms of capital safety uh, for, for investors. And these also bleed into you know, getting the green card as well, but they're primarily focused on just protecting investment funds. And we'll, we'll dig into each of these in detail, um, but just to start with a high level overview. So first, borrower quality, what does that mean? In most EB-5 projects, funds are structured as a loan so money is being loaned to a borrower. And that borrower is typically a real estate developer. And so what we mean by borrower quality is how established and how much of a track record does that borrower have? So what we're solving for is how likely is that 
borrower who's borrowing the EB-5 money, how likely is it that they're gonna repay the EB-5 money on time, right? That's the question. And so how do we figure that out? We look at track record, right? History tends to repeat itself. We look at track record, we look at repayment track record, project execution track record, assets, you know, number of projects, all those items kind of factor into the quality of the borrower. And we've listed this one as number one because this truly is the most important item when you're looking at any type of a loan investment. And it makes sense, right? If you're making a loan to, you know, your cousin John, you know, the most important thing related to that loan is how likely is it that John is going to repay you on time, right? And so you're going to look at all the factors that, you know, would go into determining that and deciding whether you want to make a loan to John or make a loan to Mary, right? Same, same types of questions, uh, because ultimately in these loan projects, the security of the money, the, the money coming back to each investor is going to be tied to, you know, that repayment event actually happening. So that's number one. Number two, financing cost, right? So how do you kind of evaluate whether one um, generally it's financing cost. So every project is going to make a big effort. They're going to spend a lot of time and effort to try to secure the lowest cost financing. So that means going to banks, to private lenders, and they're going to try and borrow money, raise money. And obviously they're going to try and raise it at as low a rate of, 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 of cost or interest rate as possible. And so a very good kind of objective way, almost like an SAT score in college admission is just, okay, you know, these five projects all went out to get a loan from a bank, a professional lender, what interest rate are these five projects paying, right? And the higher the rate, the more risk that bank or that lender has assigned to that project, right? Very objective and it's a very specific number, right? It's just easy to compare. One project interest rate is going to be 15%, another one's going to be 11, another one's going to be 8, and it's just very simple. You compare the rates, and that is a very easy way to just objectively determine which project has, has higher risk and will allow you to compare risk across projects. Um, so that's two, financing cost. Okay, three, independence. So under the RIA, all conflicts of interest need to be disclosed, right? So that means that in the documents, typically in the private placement memorandum or PPM, the project will need to describe and disclose all of the potential conflicts of interest, what parties are involved, what roles they have. And we'll get into more details on that. Um, but generally, what you wanna do is avoid unnecessary conflicts of interest. And what do we mean by that? Well, conflicts of interest are allowed under the new laws as long as they're disclosed, but that doesn't mean that you should accept them, right? And so that means that a project where, you know, the same group of people that controls the developer, the borrower, the regional center, the lender, you know, the same group that controls everything, that is a great example of a major conflict of interest where there's a significantly higher investment risk if something goes wrong. And so put simply, don't pick a project where the same group of people control both the lender, the company managing the EB-5 money, and the company that's borrowing the funds. That's a recipe for future disaster. So identify the conflict of interest. It's got to be disclosed. It can't be hidden under the current laws. So look at that. And then, you know, if that's the case, then avoid and try to find something where you've got, you've got independence. Okay, number four, project profitability. Again, pretty, pretty simple here is if you loan money to a business and the business makes a profit, succeeds economically, does well, guess what? Your loan's going to get repaid. Everything's going to go fine, right? But if you make a loan to a business that doesn't make a profit, that loses money, and guess what? most likely you're going to potentially lose money, right? So in order for you to have money coming back to repay the loan, there's got to be underlying economic success. 
And so the, the best way to look at that is just, do you think that this business activity that you're putting the money in, is it gonna be profitable, right? And the best way to determine that is, if it's already profitable, that's even better, and then you only have to really consider, is it gonna continue to be profitable, right? Or if it's not profitable yet, you know, do you think it's gonna become profitable in the future or not, right? And so the best way to approach that is just to see, is it profitable already, great, and if not profitable, what signs are there that show that you know it's likely going to be profitable in in the future, right? So those those are kind of the quick four four major points that we're going to be covering in detail. Um, and so first, let's jump into borrower quality, and we'll provide some examples of kind of questions and things to look at specifically. And I'll let Mike kind of lead us through this first one. Perfect. And and just even before looking at the slide, just thinking about the different types of developers there are out there. So you have one developer, uh, and I will use the Colter group on the left hand of the slide as an example. They've done over 150 projects, um, over $20 billion of development. They have a professional team where all that their company does is buy land and build homes, condos, hotels, multifamily. That, that's what they do, very large professional company with all the back offices in place. So that's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum are developers where it's like a family developer. Maybe they built a couple duplexes, fourplexes, and they see EB-5, and now it's time for them to take their first step into building a larger project. Like, Who do you think has a much higher chance of being successful, both in the execution of a deal and also in underwriting it correctly in making sure that they have uh, the right assumptions to make money on the project. So at the core, what we look for as a company are either large developers that have a very strong track record of success, or in the case of specific projects, a development team where the individuals have done the exact same thing many times before extremely successfully, and there's other features that make it that we feel like the borrower is of a very high quality. So it, it's just really important when you're looking at it to see how much, how much have they built, how much have they repaid? Have there been any prior bankruptcies or foreclosures or issues? And uh, in understanding what those could have been, why they happened, and uh, how likely it is that that's going to happen again. So the best answer for something like this is a developer that's done billions and billions of dollars of deals, that's never defaulted on a loan, um, that's very successful in the markets that they operate, and that's also operating in growing markets and not declining markets. Um, and once you put all of those together, you can feel really good about the borrower quality that, that you have. Now, we know some investors choose to like to invest with friends of friends, friends of family, things like that. And that's completely at an investor's discretion. But generally, when we've seen deals go wrong, it's the big deals with very bad conflicts of interest um, and bad uh, oversight and management uh, and related party issues. Um, and that leads to some problems. And a lot of the other problems uh, are just small deals that don't have all the money in place, can't get it done, lack of execution, um, lack of experience, and that's where it goes wrong. So this is one way that you can very easily identify uh, a major area of risk that you can quickly check the box on by working with a very uh, large and experienced developer and borrower with a strong track record. Great, great, thanks, thanks, Mike. Um, and I think I think another item on that same train of thought is just this information should be available out you know some of these key questions here number of projects years in business loans failed projects all of that like you should absolutely be getting that same information each of these rows from any project that you're considering right that will allow you to really identify potential issues and also allow you to compare and contrast right usually a single project's not going to have an amazing answer for every one of these. Um, some projects will have better answers than others in some categories. And so this is an easy way for you to just quickly see, okay, what are the major differences and how how safe, how reliable is this borrower? And you know, are they to the level where I'm comfortable that I think my money is going to get repaid on on time or not? Right? So so that's that's important. Yeah. And just to add to that, Sam, I think you, you and Mike have brought some really great points. And just one thing I hear a lot from investors is 
everyone puts a lot of importance, rightfully so, on looking at a regional center's track record and just seeing how long they've been in operation, what they've done in the past. It's equally important to look at the borrower in a specific deal, right? Ultimately, you know, any track record will not guarantee future success. You have to look at the deal that you're looking at to put your money into and make a decision based on that specific project, that specific borrower and what that borrower, where that borrower is currently in that deal, what's going on, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this is focused on real estate. So when you think about borrower quality, we focus on real estate because that's the majority of EB-5 deals and what we feel the best fit for EB-5 is because as you get to other industries like natural resources, oil and gas, those types of things that are usually much larger operations with completely different underwriting criteria in different lenders, it's a lot harder to, to do your diligence and figure out where the money's coming from than in relatively straightforward real estate deals, whether it's single family housing, condos, hotels, multifamily, where you can see this is where typical banks lend on with very formulaic routines, uh, just because real estate's somewhat easy to underwrite. You, you generally know what things are going to cost because you get a maximum price contract. You can see comparables. And if you're a professional developer and builder, you can have a very strong track record as, as a borrower and developer versus many other very large swing for the fences type projects. Um, it's, it's hard to assess the borrower's quality uh, especially if they haven't done the same thing a hundred times before. So that's just something else to keep in mind and part of why we we typically tend to go towards real estate deals uh, so that we can underwrite the borrowers more comprehensively. Yes, exactly. Great, great points, Mike. So second, let's talk a little bit about financing costs. Ahmed, do you want to share some thoughts on this and how that kind of factors into investors evaluating the risk of a project? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, a lot of investors, when they're kind of first going out into the EB-5 world and looking at different projects, it can be very daunting, especially when you don't have a background in finance or, at, you know, looking at real estate deals to see a capital stack and really understand what's going on. So I think the first thing that every investor should keep in mind is, look, in America, you know, there's, there's a pretty clear delineation between debt and equity. If you're going into a project on the debt side, you're always going to be a little bit safer because debt comes with collateral and it gets paid out first. So in any project that you're going into, if you're going to be on the loan side, we'll talk about what that means. You're going to be a little bit safer or more secure because you're going to get paid out first before any of the equity pieces get paid out. So that, that's one thing that a lot of investors don't when they're first looking at capital stacks understand and they kind of put equity and loan side to side. They both have their pros and cons, but if you're looking for safety of capital and you really want to you know, make sure that your principal is as secure as possible, you're going to be looking usually on a debt-based project or a debt-based EB-5 investment. Most capital stacks will be broken up into multiple pieces, right? So we've already delineated between loans and equity, right? And we see that in this capital stack right here. So let's just take a very easy example of a $100 million project let's say the project goes out and says, okay, you know, we're gonna put in uh, about 15% of our own equity and they've got, you know, some other investors that they're getting preferred equity from. So they put in $25 million through equity that they've raised themselves. Where are they gonna get the rest of the money, right? So they go out and they ask a bank and the bank says, hey, you know what? This project looks great, but we really only feel comfortable giving you about $50 million, right? That becomes what is commonly referred to as a senior loan. This is going to be the most senior debt on the deal. This is the money that gets paid back first. In the event that something goes wrong in the project and they default on this loan, that that bank is going to be able to go in, get their money out first before anybody, including the developer themselves, would get paid. So this is typically the safest part of the capital stack. It sits at the very top and it's always going to be the lowest cost of capital because lower the risk, the lower the reward as well, right? Then we come to the mezzanine loan. And so let, now this developer's got 25 million, in this example, it's got $25 million of their own money. They've got $50 million in the bank. They're still short another 25 million. So they go out and they find this debt elsewhere and you know maybe for another bank. And this bank says, sure, we'll give you this 25 million. We believe in this project, but 
we're definitely taking more of a risk, right? We're sitting beneath the senior loan, something goes wrong, that bank's gonna get their money back, but we're definitely gonna be kind of fighting an uphill battle to really get our money. So we're gonna charge a much higher interest rate because higher risk, higher reward for us, right? We're willing to underwrite this deal, but we want something more out of it because we're taking a much higher risk. So that mezzanine loan is typically going to be at a much higher percentage than the senior loan, right? And so when you're looking at where the EB-5 money fits into this, into a deal like this, you really want to see what it's replacing, right? Ultimately, if you're replacing a mezzanine loan that was originally charging 15%, right, you're looking at a 15% kind of risk relative to what the senior loan may have been charging, which might have been like 8 or 9%, right? So that, that's that's one easy way to kind of just determine, okay, if the EB-5 money is coming in and replacing senior debt, I feel a lot better about where my money is going in because the, the, the first bank in this example has already underwritten this and felt safe about that, uh, that, that amount of financing, right? But if I'm coming in and replacing mezzanine debt, I'm already sitting behind the senior loan and now I'm basically getting a much smaller return and a much higher risk uh, than, than, than you know the senior loan that, that I would have if I had replaced the senior loan. So this is an easy way to kind of determine one, what kind of risk am I taking when depending on where I'm going into the capital stack. And then as you're comparing different projects, looking at their uh, various capital stacks and comparing them and seeing if there was no EB-5 money in the deal, what each tranche or what each level of this um, capital stack was charging, you can compare those and easily assess the risk in, in a project. Yep, that, that's great on that. And I would say that one thing to keep in mind is there are some people that try and game this that try and show things like an inflated equity number by marking up land by 500%. Um, it's uh, things like that where they show different types of things. Other ones will, uh, I've seen people called that senior and today it might be senior, but in the loan terms, there's tons of gotchas where if certain metrics aren't hit with the amount of EB-5, that money actually becomes subordinated um, and another senior can come ahead of it. So really it's mezzanine debt, even though technically today it's senior. Versus a lot of the way that we structure, we prefer transparency where one, one example that we have is the Keystone project. Um, currently our debt is in the mezzanine position, but there's already repayment methods through condo sales to take out the senior and our money will effectively become senior at the closing of condos that are already sold. So we're going the opposite way. We're going to tell you transparently today this is subordinated debt, but all of the seniors covered and it becomes senior and we put it out there versus the other approach of just saying, oh, this is senior um, without any of the caveats of the other financing that can, can come in. So I would say it's not, it's never quite as simple as looking at a chart like this and trusting everything on face value. I wish it was. Unfortunately, you do really need to dig in and do your homework and see, is that equity real? Is it cash? Is it inflated land value? Is, are you actually senior or are there other things that can come ahead of you and make you subordinated and what are those triggers? So I would say always do your diligence on the project and understand what's going on in the capital stack. That, that's one of the hardest things to figure out without being a finance professional and one of the places where we've seen people play games. So I, I would say that is just one thing to dig into. Yeah, yep. Yep. yeah definitely agree with that. And yeah, I think you know, you know, we we have projects that have offerings at kind of different levels. You know, it's not to say that one there's only one way to structure an EB five project or only one piece of this capital stack that you always want to replace. That's definitely not what we're saying. But yeah, looking at capital stacks and kind of going through the documents and looking for those gotchas that Mike mentioned is a really really good way to establish one. You know, relative risk when looking at different projects comparing them to one another, and then two, just transparency, right? Where is this sitting in the, in the capital stack? And is there language in, in the documents that's actually hiding where it could be in the future or what's really going on kind of underneath the surface? Yep, and if uh, as you review you know, these different projects that are out there, like if you're not sure of something or if you have questions, like EB-5 is a small space, we're, we're pretty familiar with a lot of the other projects that are available. And, we're happy to help you know, answer questions and kind of help compare and contrast. We've looked at hundreds of documents over the years, and so pretty easy for us to you know, very quickly figure out 
you know where where problems you know where problems can lie. Okay, Ahmed, do you want to talk to us a little bit about independence and also um, on the attorney side as well, in addition to just the kind of project operation side? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so you know, here you're looking at kind of a, a general chart that you might see. Uh, for in terms of how a regional center project is structured, right? So there's two key entities here to always pay attention to, and especially in terms of who owns those entities and who controls and manages and has power within them, right? And that's the, the new commercial enterprise, which we've got listed here as the NCE, and then the JCE, or the job creating enterprise, right? So in most nearly every project that you're going to see you know you're as an eb5 investor you'll be investing into the nce which is a partnership in in most cases right you along with the other investors go into this partnership and then that partnership then makes a loan or an equity investment into the project company which is the jce now typically you know who, who's controlling the nce and that money going into the project company it's usually going to be a general partner and that's typically the regional center themselves right so you you've got a regional center who's kind of on your behalf making the investment either through a loan or an equity investment into the project company and so they're also responsible for that investment right something goes wrong they're able to on behalf of the partnership kind of recoup that capital or take the necessary steps to recoup that capital right now here you see the developer is typically who's controlling the jc right and that makes sense when the when the partnership makes the loan or the equity investment to the project company that's the developer now taking control of the capital and deploying it into the project and ultimately doing what the business plan says that it's going to do where you can run into some issues right and 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 again you should always look at this under the lens of what happens when something goes wrong right when everything goes right it doesn't really matter how this is structured when everything goes right you're going to get your money back everything's going to go well but what happens when something goes wrong right ultimately if the developer and we you know if the developer is also the general partner basically one entity are they going to sue themselves to then recoup capital on behalf of the investors in the partnership? Hard to imagine that that would be the case, right? So what we've seen in the past, and you know, we hear a lot about vertically integrated developer regional centers saying, hey, this is the best way to do it, because if something goes wrong, well, they're already a developer. They've got the experience to kind of come in and basically fix the project, quote unquote, right? But the reality is that if the developer is already in a project that isn't doing so hot, what's to say that they're going to act now on the investor's best interests to then return that capital, right? They've got a project on their hands that isn't doing so well. And instead of being able to return the money, they're not going to, they're certainly not going to reach into their own pockets to do that. They're going to try to fix the project, but ultimately that may be at the cost of the investor, right? That may be in their best interest, but maybe not in the investor's best interest. So I think that this is a common fallacy that that's peddled around within the industry of, hey, vertical integration is the only way that a project can be kind of fixed. But in reality, I think a third party regional center who's basically on the hook as much as the investors are, right? I think what gets lost a lot is when we're a third party regional center, we're acting on the investor's behalf and we make an investment into this project company, if something bad happens, we also stop making money. So it's in our vested interest to act on the partnership's behalf and do whatever is necessary to recoup that principle and also generate as much income as we can because we need to make money as well. That's that's really the best way to ensure that there's no conflict of interest and you've got someone acting on your behalf or someone who's basically on your team, right? In in this whole in this whole structure. Yeah, yeah, and I would say that the most important thing there that you said, Ahmed, is when things go right, the conflicts of interest are never a problem. Like every, like 99 out of 100 times, if they're good projects, even if there's a conflict there, completely fine. It's all about, and what we focus on is if things go wrong in that downside chance, how do we protect ourselves and our investors? And that's why we think it's so important to have that independence, just because you never want money going from one pocket to another from somebody and then being in charge of both sides of it. You always want to have that arm's length relationship and have a manager in there that's representing the investors that's different just in case things go wrong. So again, you can choose to ignore conflicts of interest. And if you have 100% confidence the project is going to be successful, 
sure, you can check this box and not worry about it, but we always like to be on the side of what happens when things go wrong. Yep, ex exactly. And this, this next slide here kind of just illustrates some of those concepts in more detail where, you know, again, if things go wrong, the developer is going to act in their best interest and they're not going to act in the best interest of the investors. Whereas if you have an independent manager controlling the general partner who's managing one group of people to worry about, which is the investors, and so there's no conflict and it's very clear, you know, for what actions that they're going to take are going to be in, in the investor's best interests. Um, one, one other point that I want to... Um, can you talk a little bit about hiring an attorney who's worked on the project and all the conflicts that kind of come come on that and why we really emphasize that any investor can choose any attorney that they like and you know they're not going to be hiring anyone that's that's worked on or represented EB5 AN. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, this this is something that comes up often within the industry. It is small. And it is niche. And yeah, at EB5 AN, I think one of the things that we emphasize is you want to avoid all unnecessary conflicts of interest, right? We just kind of talked about one of the biggest ones, but Sam just brought up another one that that definitely exists. And when you're hiring an attorney, it's the same kind of concept, right? You want an attorney who's going to go to bat for you, that you want them to be on your side. They're your attorney. And you don't want an attorney who's kind of going to be to, 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 you know, to put it bluntly, they're going to have hands in both jars, right? They're representing you. They're also representing the regional center. And now they've kind of got to choose when something goes wrong. So the best case scenario is when you go into a project, you, you choose an attorney who's completely independent. Sure, they may have filed for other investors in the same project. That's totally okay. But they, you know, they don't have any, the, 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 the regional center is not also their client directly and creating that conflict of interest that if something goes wrong and that in, in, that attorney now has to represent you in order to you know get money back or to basically make sure that you get your green card like all those things i guess more so on the immigration side because the green card right that's that's really where the immigration attorney is most relevant yeah you want them to totally be looking out for you and not worried about okay what should i be doing for the project overall that might kind of save how help the regional center save face or fix the job creation issues or things like that that's a different problem altogether you want your attorney to just be focused on okay like raj invested with me he's you know he's my client i'm going to do everything i can in my power to make sure that raj gets his green card through this process and whatever else happens out there happens at the end of the day i'm focused solely on raj i'm going to bat just for raj so that's really something that i think people should be aware of and this is a really, really easy conflict to identify because any attorney has to disclose any conflict of interest in their engagement agreement. So don't just sign on the dotted line. Always be looking at the engagement agreement and looking for any waivers or disclosures of um, conflict of interest because, yeah, like Sam mentioned, every single aspect of this investment is so important. And this is one way that you can gain an advantage where other people may not be looking for it. You want to have everyone that you're hiring and paying good money for on your team in the event that something goes wrong. Just like Mike said, when things go right, nothing to worry about. But when something goes wrong, you want to make sure that everyone that you've hired and paid money to is going to bat solely for you. And an easy, easy way, again, as Ahmed mentioned, check the engagement agreement, but just simple, simple question in writing, like, have you in the past or are you currently taking money from the regional center of the project? Just very simple. If the answer is yes, move on, find a different attorney. Answer is no, then at least you know, all right, this person's not, you know, financially motivated and has, you know, a major, a major conflict, right? There's thousands of attorneys out there and in any traditional transaction, I'm willing to hire an attorney that's also representing the other side. That's crazy. That is just so uncommon in any other transaction. Um, but unfortunately in EB-5, because a lot of investors you know, haven't hired attorneys in the past and don't really know what to look for, this is becoming an issue. And so it's just something that, you know, again, as Ahmed mentioned, if things go great, not an issue, but you know, you've got as, an, as investors in any capacity, 
whether it's for a green card or for a profit or for whatever, you know, you always want to be looking at, all right, if things go great, I'm sure it'll be fine. But if things don't go great, what protections have I, you know, put in place to try and, you know, make sure that I'm still protected? Mike, do you want to walk us through profitability? Yep. And this, this comes back to one of the other reasons why we primarily focus on real estate deals, because it's very simple to get to the conclusion. So within profitability, there's a few different ways to look at it. One is uh, like a deal that we have, the Twin Lakes, Georgia project, the developers already sold hundreds and hundreds of homes. The deal is profitable. You can see what they make on every single house and the deal self-sustaining. So a track record in the exact project to sales, whether it's that or it's phase two of an established and existing project or very similar to something nearby that's profitable and you can tell, easy to check the box that the deal could be viable on that side. Now you still have to validate the cost and make sure it all makes sense. But that is something where even as a novice investor, you can do your homework on, is this deal already making money? Another way that you can do that, and this is more similar to our Kindred project, is uh, they've been pre-selling the condominiums. They've pre-sold over 70% setting records in the county for sales prices. So you can see exactly what everything sold for with non-refundable deposits. And you can tell what it costs to build because we have the construction budget. And you can tell, yes, this deal is profitable. So there's a high likelihood of getting your money back because there's cushion there where you're making money over the cost. So th those are the two ways to do it in real estate. Now, where it gets a lot harder to do is operating businesses. So this is where I used to be in LBOs, leverage buyouts of operating companies. And it's a lot harder to value those companies, evaluate the prospects, and a lot more risk of execution on operational type businesses than there is on building something where you know what it's going to cost, you can see what it's going to sell for, and you can sometimes even get ahead of the profitability. So in all of those different factors of whether it's profitable today, will be in the future, how you evaluate it, tie into getting the money back. I mean, people can promise any loan term they want and any return they want. Um, and if their disclosure documents could have all the carve outs there, but a lot of the time you just really need to use common sense of, is this project likely to get my money back in this time frame um, while still being low risk? You could have a very speculative project out there that's, um, I'm, I'm not gonna use any specific examples, but on the operational side where if it goes really well, everybody's gonna get rich in the deal, uh, probably other than the EB-5 investors who are going to get a very low return, but if it doesn't go well, everybody kind of walks away. Like that's a bad deal. And even if they tell you you'll get your money back in three years, what has to happen? For you to get that money back in three years. Look at the chain of events and the likelihood of each one of those events to achieve profitability. And that will help you evaluate is the profitability in a deal like Twin Lakes where it's already happening. Like that's about as close to 100% as you can get knowing that there's proof points. Or is it on the other side of if X, Y, and Z happen and we do this, then we think we'll make a really big return. It's just a very different analysis. And that's real estate versus non-real estate. And within real estate, it, it's going down to the exact same question of, has it been done before? How do you see if it's profitable uh, and go down that direction? Yeah, and, and again, like we, 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 we prefer simple, right? As, as smart as Mike and I think we are, we're not, we're not geniuses, right? Everyone, you know, everyone has a limit, right? And so we, we only invest in things that we understand. And we, we understand basic residential real estate. You buy the land for X, your construction cost is Y, you sell it for Z, right? You subtract the first two from Z, there's your profit. Very simple, right? Lots of comparables. You can understand, you can check Zillow, you can see what something's worth, what it's selling for. You can get a bid for a construction cost. It's, it's very simple math. Right. And it's very simple for an investor to understand, are these projections credible? Right. You can go on Zillow. You can check, you know, rental rates. You can check, you know, what hotels are renting for in the area. It's not that hard to figure out whether assumptions are realistic. Operational business, like, for example, you know. Uh, or, you know, a mine or an energy natural gas company right? Things that are not very common where it's not easy to see, okay, what's the real cost here? Are the revenue numbers reasonable? You know, what are the comparables that I can see what something else similar sold for? 
those things would be very, very difficult for experienced investors like me and Mike to, to try to figure out, right? And if they're going to be hard for people like us who've been investing, you know, 30 years of experience, it's going to be very difficult for an investor who has no experience and not a lot of time to spend to try to figure out whether or not the projections that they're looking at are actually credible. I'm sure they'll look profitable and everything will, you know, look like it's going to make money, but you've got to you you you've got to dig in, right? There's a famous saying from from the Cold War, trust but verify, right? Just because the numbers on the page show it's going to be profitable in 5 years, you shouldn't trust that alone. You need to do outside research, check Zillow, check the comps and just see, you know, at the end of the day it's your money, right? So it doesn't it doesn't matter what the salesperson says doesn't matter what the projection says. At the end of the day, you're the only one that needs to be convinced or not. And so after reviewing everything, looking at all the information, you just need to say, you know, am I personally confident that this thing is going to be profitable and make money over the next five years? And if the answer is yes, then you should invest. If the answer is, I don't know. I don't really understand what's happening. Probably not a good idea. For you to invest in that project and look for something that you understand and you're confident that you think it's going to be economically profitable for you because the return of your capital is is going to be tied to whether or not it actually is profitable or or not um and you know you can read i don't want to read all this text on here but just because a loan has a set maturity date of of, of three years for example if the underlying economic activity isn't there, isn't successful, guess what? There's no cash flow. There's no money to pay back that loan. What does that mean? Loan's going to be extended and or default and, you know, could take a lot longer or you may never get the money back at all, right? So, you know, just because something has a set loan term of X, you've got to look at, well, where's that money actually coming from? And is there going to be money there to pay back that loan on time? All right. Yeah, we'll, I think. We'll go ahead. Sorry, on. just one one last piece. Yeah, I just think that a lot of the calculus that I'm starting to hear with the new sustainment period uh, guidance is, oh, well, this project is offering X amount of return, or this project is offering that amount of you know timeline. And the reality is, like it used to be, am I going to get my money back or not? And I feel like that's probably what people are starting to forget because these big numbers can kind of blind you as you're looking at projects of like. Oh, three years return, but is it really a three years return if the project doesn't do well, right? So you have to look at kind of the underlying economics of the project first. And then like we mentioned on the very first slide, right? The priority is it's got to be the, the safety of the capital. And then you can look towards getting a return on your investment or getting the money back sooner. If the first thing doesn't happen, you can kiss the rest of it goodbye as well. All right. Thank you, Ahmed. All right, so now we're going to we're going to shift gears and talk a little bit about two of our current rural EB5 projects, Twin Lakes Georgia and Keystone, and then we'll try to cover a few questions at the end. Mike, do you want to walk us through a summary of Twin Lakes? Yep, yeah, and I and I'm going to do this through the lens of exactly what we just discussed. So Twin Lakes is a large neighborhood of 1300 single family homes being built right outside of Atlanta, Georgia one county over from the MSA limit. It qualifies as rural. We have the first two phases of the steel 956F approved, including the first loan phase, which is the exact same as what we have uh, in the current offering. 526 is approved already. So you can check that box on the immigration side. Um, the project has already been approved by the government and they've already created enough jobs for every investor. So that lens, you can check it. Next is on the capital side. So single family home deals are inherently a little bit hard to understand when looking at the capital stack. And there's a lot of things that can move within the capital structure. This deal overall is over $600 million of spend. And there's going to be um, a, 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 a good amount of EB-5 on it. This offering is $80 million. And one of the unique things here is that we also have a repayment guarantee from Coulter. So that ties into who's the borrower. So the borrower's Coulter very experienced developer, only um, 
only done 20 billion of development, uh, more than that actually. So they know what they're doing and how to uh, manage their deals and manage their, their capital structure. So we have a repayment guarantee from one of their parent entities. Um, and the Colder Group's been doing this since the, the 90s. They've never defaulted on a loan. They've never left a project unfinished, even through the recessions that we've had from the 90s through today. So when we're looking at borrower quality, we can check that box. When we're looking at profitability, we can check that box. They're already selling homes and making money, and this deal makes sense, having sold over 600 homes uh, in this neighborhood. So you check those boxes. And then when you're going through some of the other things in terms of their other costs of capital, they have a very attractive senior facility on this project, a small revolving facility from a local bank. Wells Fargo used to be in it, a uh, very low cost debt. And then the last is conflicts of interest to where uh, we're not the developer, we're third party regional center, we're looking out for investors, we're going to enforce the covenants on the loan. So when you look at this project as a whole, it checks all of those different boxes that we're looking for as a regional center and fund manager of trying to minimize the immigration financial risk and make sure that our investors have a successful outcome. Yep, ex exactly. And as Mike mentioned, we have two prior phases with the 956F a lot of investors coming in uh, over the last couple of months. And here, here are some examples of those recent approvals. For those investors who aren't able to visit the project uh, in person, we have a very helpful driving tour video so you can see exactly what the project looks like uh, driving around. We also have an event coming up on March 16th, Saturday afternoon, 12 to 4 p.m. Uh, all three of us uh, will be at the project site uh, in just a few weeks. I think we already have almost 50 investors who've signed up to visit the project on that day, Saturday, March 16th. Uh, so if you're interested in, in coming and seeing everything in person and meeting with some top EB-5 attorneys as well that day, please reach out to us, schedule a call, and we can get you the get you the details uh, so you can join us for that event. Here's a couple of photos of recent construction in the project, clubhouse is done, amenities done, all of that. And as Mike mentioned, one of the unique aspects of this project is that we have a separate repayment guarantee from one of Coulter's parent holding companies, which secures the EB-5 loan. Um, this is allowed under USCIS rules. We just got the 956F approval uh, in the last week, and we've used this structure on more than 10 prior deals with Coulter, and it's been approved every time. So don't let other people try to confuse you and tell you that a repayment guarantee is not allowed. That's bullshit. It is allowed. It's been approved many times. Um, basically, the way it works is Coulter's much larger parent company, which owns many, many projects, is separately promising to repay the EB-5 loan, which reduces the risk. In many projects, funds are being loaned to a specific address, a specific location. And if things don't go well at that one site, investors could lose money. In our structure, the money is being used in Twin Lakes to meet all the EB-5 program requirements for job creation in a rural area. But in addition to the loan at the project, there's also a separate promise from one of Coulter's parent companies to repay the money. And that's really valuable because it diversifies the risk across many projects and Coulter Again, as a quality borrower, they've borrowed billions of dollars, repaid billions of dollars successfully, never not repaid a single loan ever uh, in almost 30 years. Publicly traded banks, um, oftentimes these loans are hundreds of millions of dollars each. And I can assure you that a bank is not lending $100 million to a random developer, right? They've obviously done the homework and they're not writing a nine-figure check. To, to just anyone. And this is a quick map showing uh, where, where many of their current and past projects are located. Speak a little bit about our Kindred Resort at, at Keystone Project. Mike, do you wanna give us the overview again here? Yes, absolutely. And this deal is a little bit of a different flavor than Twin Lakes. So um, it still meets all of those different risk criteria, but we think that it's helpful to have different types of deals uh, for different investor priorities. So this is a condominium and hotel deal, 95 condo units, 107 hotel rooms. 
uh, right at the base of the Keystone main gondola. So one of the larger ski resorts in the country, this was a parcel that Vail has owned forever, and it's finally being developed. And this deal is well under construction. They've already topped out two of the three towers, and enough jobs have been created for every EB-5 investor. So just like Twin Lakes, the day that you invest, we already have enough EB-5 jobs for every investor, and the deal's fully capitalized, so we can check those boxes off on the execution risk of, they can build this, the jobs are there, investors are getting their green card. When it comes down to the borrower quality, um, this developer, uh, it's a development team. They've done many deals before. And one of the unique things on this is that although we're coming in as subordinated debt at the start, because there is a senior construction lender, there's enough condominium proceeds um, coming through the pre-sale that they have to fully repay that construction loan. And then we will have the mortgage on the operational hotel. Uh, and all of the other assets of the company. So we've protected ourselves in a, in a different way than Twin Lakes um, without the repayment guarantee, but instead we'll have a senior mortgage on the property and be first in line for repayment for the EB-5 investors. So that's one of those other things that we think is a really, it's a different structure and it's very simple. You know exactly what's happening. This is your asset. This will stay your asset. This is your uh, investment in the EB-5 and in a project that we were just out visiting a couple weeks ago and the uh, project is going amazing. Construction's going great. Um, and for the similar reason, it checks all of those boxes that we can be comfortable as the sponsor, knowing that we're going to achieve the goals of get the green card, protect the money, and return it back to the investors. Yep. And we'll, we'll, we'll share a few photos and kind of an overlay of, of the project. This is kind of an overall rendering that shows the proximity to the main gondola there on the left side. And then a recent construction photo showing, you know, the advanced construction progress of the project as of uh, just just a few weeks ago. And yeah, long story short, construction's progressing really well, and they're they're on schedule per per the development timeline. And you can see here just how close the building is to to the main gondola there. And one of the other aspects of this project is the management of the hotel, um, which is going to be managed by Vail Resorts Public Company going to be the manager of the hotel and the rental pool of all of the of all the condominiums and as we mentioned earlier about 70 percent of the condos are already sold prices have continued to increase uh, since sales started uh, over a year ago and only the large um, kind of best view units are, are the ones remaining which are going to be sold at a premium as construction uh, can continues toward completion all right, that, that kind of concludes all of our formal um, remarks for today. I think, um, Ahmed, can you, we, what, one of, a couple of the questions we got are about partial payments. Can you spend just a minute kind of describing how we can accommodate partial payments in, in either of the projects and why that's allowed under USCIS rules and then also kind of dovetail into the upcoming fee increase and why that's gonna be very popular for investors over the next month or so? Yep, absolutely. So yeah, like Sam mentioned, most of our projects, in fact, all of our projects allow for a partial investment. USCIS has basically over the years uh, come very familiar with this concept and the RIA pretty much put it in writing where you're able to basically, as long as you are, can show USCIS that you are in the process of investing, you can do what's called a partial investment. And this is where there's going to be a minimum amount that's going to change you know, from project to project, but you can start with that, have line of sight on the rest of your funds and where those funds are gonna come from, and then file the application without the full $800,000 being invested. So definitely reach out to us and let us know, you know, what your situation is. This is definitely gonna vary. There's not a one size fits all. Um, like I said, each project will have a separate minimum requirement, but we'll be happy to chat with you to talk through the different options that you'll have and whether or not it's possible. Um, and it's also one of the key things that's going to be very important in the coming days as, you know, USCIS is set to increase the fee by almost $8,000 for the filing fee um, starting on April 1st. So we're already at February 16th. There's very, very few days left to, to basically engage an EB-5 attorney before it just gets overwhelming for each one of these practitioners and they're unable to, to basically accommodate new, new clients. So if you're thinking about doing EB-5, there's no time kind of like the present to, 
not just save yourself eight thousand dollars on on the filing fee but really just be able to to, to file an application there's going to be a clear rush of people right i think mike and sam you guys can definitely confirm that as well like our phones have been ringing off the hook a lot of people are you know looking to invest over the next month and this is a twofold thing right one you don't definitely don't want to get lost in that shuffle so you want to make sure that you've got an attorney engaged who's already looking at your case and two, as you start to think about the number of filings in each of the reserved categories, you know, we don't have a lot of data in terms of how many filings are already in. But one thing that I think anyone will tell you is over the next month, there's going to be a sharp increase in the number of filings. And so your priority date becomes even more important than it was before. And one of the really, really great ways and flexibilities that we provide to lock in a priority date even if you maybe have to sell a home down the road or you have to liquidate some stocks that maybe have invested you can still get your application started you can still lock in your priority date you can still get your ead and advanced parole if you're in the united states and you can basically you know push push the, the investment out a couple of months or a few months and still be able to get your 526e approval with no issue so Reach out to our team. We're happy to help with your specific situation. And definitely, this is the time to, to reach out to immigration attorneys. We're happy to recommend quite a few. We work with everyone in the industry and make sure that you've got one engaged for, for these next few weeks. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Ahmed. Mike, any, any final comments? Um, I'd say the main thing is just that as you're looking, it's always helpful to evaluate several different EB-5 projects. There is no one size fits all anymore. There's different priorities that you can have in the project. And with the RIA, you're able to do a little bit um, more with the structuring um, in the current capital markets environment and plus RIA. Uh, there's different ways of structuring deals. So definitely don't feel bad about asking the hard questions. Um, go through the documents yourself. Ask all the questions that, that come to your mind and don't be satisfied until you get answers. And there's some deals that are very complicated and takes a long time to understand. There's others that are very simple, but that would be one of my main recommendations is just um, don't take everything at face value. Um, don't look at a capital stack and say, oh, that looks great. Like dig into it, uh, try and do your homework. Um, and yeah, their time is limited before April 1st. Um, missing that isn't catastrophic. Uh, it is more expensive to file afterwards. Make sure that you choose the right project rather than rushing. But if you are in a position to file um, and you're evaluating projects, there is still time to figure out the, the ones that are the best fit and get in before the deadline. Great. Great. Thanks, Mike. Yeah. So I, I, I put a message in the chat. Um, you know, if you are interested in getting more details about any of these projects, the best way to get in touch with our team is to schedule a call. And one of us can chat with you, get you access to all the financial information, all the documents, disclosures. We're happy to share the financial statements so you can see exactly how the entities are capitalized, profitability, all of that. I think we're the only company in the EB-5 industry that's actively doing that. Um, so please don't hesitate, reach out. We can also connect you with a number of experienced EB-5 attorneys that have the capacity to get your application filed uh, if you choose to do a partial uh, investment before the upcoming deadline on April 1. And on that day, of course, the current USCIS filing fee for the Form I-526 is now $3,600 approximately, and it's jumping up to over $11,000. Um, so almost an $8,000 increase that's coming on April 1. And so um, that's why there's going to be, there is a large rush of investors who are filing uh, leading up to that April 1st deadline. Uh, this webinar will be posted online, uh, and if you're interested in getting a copy of the slides or more details, schedule a call with us, and we'll we'll get you all the info. So thank you again, everybody, uh, and appreciate your time today.